The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning or good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to our webinar on Closing the Gap, Bridging Research and Practice in Energy Access. Uh, this is one of the series of webinars which are being run by the Smart Villages Initiative and the Low Carbon Energy for Development Network, LCEDN. Um, we've got a great uh, array of speakers for you all today, but before we uh, start with the presentations, uh, we would like to just run a couple of polls to find out who we've got here uh, sharing the webinar with us. So those polls will uh, flash up on your screens shortly um, and we'll give everybody a couple of minutes to be able to click the relevant button. So first we're asking where everybody is based around the world. So those questions are coming up now. If you would like to click one of the buttons uh, between the Americas and the Caribbean, uh, Good morning to all of you, very early morning. Uh, Africa and Europe around lunchtime and uh, South Asia, Middle East and the Asia Pacific regions. If you could let us know where you're from. I'll just give that five more seconds. One, two, three, four, five. Super. So, um, a remarkable number of people joining us from the Americas. Good morning to all of you, and thank you very much for getting up very early to join us. 70% um, uh, from uh, Europe and Africa, and uh, only just a few uh, still now from uh, the Asian regions. Okay, and the second polling question, uh, just to ask what sort of sectors people work in, uh, whether you're policymakers maybe, or from the business side, or from the academics, or NGOs, or other. So we're launching that question now. If you'd like to click one of the buttons again. So we can see the sectors that you're all coming from. I'll give that just a few more seconds. One, two, three, four, five. Thank you very much. So a nice combination there um, across all the sectors. Uh, half from uh, academia and research. Uh, that's uh, especially good to uh, to hear from the subject of today's uh, webinar. Uh, but a good representation from the policy making uh, and entrepreneurial sectors and NGOs and other as well. So thank you very much for that. Uh, just to let you know a little bit about the format of the webinar, uh, we'll have a few more welcoming statements and then we'll go straight into the presentations. Uh, the three presenters will each present for around 10 minutes and then we will have a question and answer session. Uh, we'd like to encourage you to send in your questions uh, using the, the online facility uh, throughout the whole webinar. And those questions will be collected. Uh, if there are little specific questions for us to answer, we'll uh, pass that to one or other of the presenters and you'll uh, receive a response back. Uh, but for some of the more general questions, uh, we will have a, a panel question and answer session at the end. Uh, and those questions will be read out and we will all have a chance to uh, engage with them. So please do send in your questions and we look forward to, uh, to receiving those. Right, before we continue, I'd like to invite uh, John Cloak from the uh, LCEDN to also give us a few words of welcome. Over to you, John. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Bernie, and uh, thanks everyone for, for coming along to, to this webinar. Um, as you may or may not know, this is the, the, the latest in a series of these, and I hope you guys will get the chance to kind of go on the Smart Villages website and have a look at the previous uh, webinars. They've, in general, been very well, well attended and well received, and we hope to continue that. So just a, a little thing about the LCEDN, Low Carbon Energy for Development Network, which is www.lcedn.com. Please do go and have a look at our website. And basically, we're a network of academics, practitioners, private sector and policy people in the UK dedicated to pushing forward the agenda for um, low carbon transitions, um, mainly in the global south, but also uh, in the global north increasingly now. And the topic of this talk is of particular interest to me because uh, a lot of our people are academics who do uh, both practitioners and who maybe start uh, spin up 
companies from their universities uh do consultancy work as well so there's a a massive um gray area perhaps we should call it where uh how, how academia best fits into the practitioner world the policy world and, and and above all the private sector world uh more effectively to push forward this low carbon energy agenda okay so bernie that's all i want to say thank you excellent thanks very much john so without further ado i will invite our uh our first presenter to uh, give her presentation. And the first presenter is, uh, we're very lucky to have Sarah Begg, who is the Global Knowledge and Learning Officer for Practical Action. So let me. Throw it over to Sarah. Sarah will unmute herself and give us her presentation. <laughs> Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I'm just loading my presentation so that you can all see. Perfect. Okay, great. So firstly, thank you to Smart Villages for this opportunity to speak today. I'm delighted to share our approach with you all uh, from such a global audience, which is really exciting this morning. So just to introduce myself firstly, my name is Sarah Begg and I'm from Practical Action. For those who don't know of Practical Action, we're an international development charity focusing on appropriate technologies and technologies, looking at issues to do with energy access, water, sanitation and hygiene, disaster risk reduction and sustainable agriculture. I lead on our learning and knowledge agendas at Practical Action and a part of our policy and practice team. So with a specific remit at of ensuring and encouraging practice change and putting what we know at Practical Action into use. More recently, we've been working with the LCDN network, um, looking at how to put academic knowledge into use and looking at the impacts of knowledge more generally. So I'd like to take the opportunity today to talk to you about an approach that we've been using. So I will give you a broader overview and then my colleague from Bangladesh will give you a more contextualized case study. Please feel free to ask any questions in the question and answer session later on. Great, okay. So at first glance, the academic world and the NGO world may seem completely separate. However, at the moment, there seems to be a particular demand that both of these worlds have in common. The academic world seems to be there a pressure to demonstrate research tangibly. What are the outcomes of studies and what is this happening in reality? What are the actions of research? And what are those more tangible aspects in reality? In the NGO world, there's a continuous pressure to evidence what we know and what we don't know. as a real kind of buzz around this word evidence. So with those two pressures in mind, what brings the two worlds together is uptake. Let me just quickly explain what I mean by uptake. Uptake is basically about thinking about the outcomes of research, thinking about what actually happens in reality, thinking about actioning research and creating some kind of tangible or intangible change, really putting what we know into use. Uptake is ultimately the ultimate goal of research communications and is something that we should seek to achieve. So I'd like to talk uh, to you about the thing is the link towards um oh. so um oh, sorry. the planning around the science faculty okay. have made strong objections to committing to giving people jobs at the end of winter yep. words. It's likely the university got somebody else speaking to iron by a job that could so that means you can't we can't support people. Like, sorry. You can support them, but they're working on the wording now to make it clear that it's not a guarantee. So the guarantee is required to point to the So this is, well, actually, so they will not be supporting it. Apologies, I can't find out who's on the line at the moment. I'll keep having a look for you. Thank you. That it's not science, they absolutely won't do it. But they won't go for society if that's what society says. So this is coming down. I don't know, this is just in the last week. Okay, it certainly has an impact on what we do. So, sorry. Sorry, Jeremy. I'm surprised with this because it's you who 
research center thing. The mm -hmm. discussion seems to be going on about set up uh, PDRs to one link. So a feedback, the feedback is in front of it, who moves on that part possibly or not. So Hi, yeah. sorry, I'm just trying to get a hold of Bernie because I can't see who it is. Um, it looks like it could have been Ben, but I can't uh, on the list to um, make him go quiet. <laughs> no, apologies. Okay. This, is, this is very curious. We, uh, we're getting some, uh, some sound cutting across, but we can't actually tell where it's coming from. That's, that's, I think we're okay. Good. Great. Okay. So I will continue. Sorry about that, everybody. Okay. So just to recap then. So I was just talking about updates. Okay. There we go. We're sorted. Sorry about that, everybody. So I was just talking about uptake. So uptake is ultimately the end goal of research communications, trying to put what we know into practice. To try and encourage that, I'd like to talk about three pillars of how we try to frame research uptake here at Practical Action, an approach that we've been using with the Low Carbon Development Network. So there's three pillars, which I'd like to call the three A's, appropriateness, availability, and accessibility. And I'll talk to you briefly in turn about these three pillars. So firstly is about appropriateness. This basically refers back to our audience, trying to understand who is it that needs research? Who is it who can benefit from research and who can use research in practice? But equally thinking about who are those stakeholders who can open the gates to unheard communities, unheard practitioners, and those who don't necessarily get to put their views and their knowledge forwards. So we're trying to encourage something called early stakeholder engagement, and we can draw upon systems thinking to do that, mapping out who potentially can use research from at the research design stage can help us to really think about how knowledge can travel beyond research products. We then need to think about engaging with them, thinking about what is it they need to know. We're asking about knowledge gaps, thinking about challenges, thinking about what is it that practitioners, NGO workers, government officials, public sector individuals really need to know to advance their initiatives. Equally, we don't always know what we don't know. So we need to think about having that balance between supply and demand. So for example, in the poll, we asked the question around knowledge gaps not people, women in the poor were asking about trying to understand income generation activities, but didn't necessarily know about mushroom farming. So therefore we need to have a balance between the supply of knowledge and the demand of knowledge and really mapping that out at the beginning. Equally, once we've understood who our stakeholders are and who our audiences are going to be, we need to think about how to appropriately communicate with them from the start, thinking about what those different preferences would be. And to do that, you might hold a focus group, semi-structured interviews, or even do a systems map. The second pillar I'd like to talk to you about is availability of knowledge. It's not a fact that we need new knowledge all the time and new research to be commissioned, but actually thinking about how do we capture that existing body of knowledge, not just in terms of imperial studies, but also what is it that practitioners can tell? What are those insights of, of information, learning, knowledge, understanding that can really inform studies as well? We've come to know that knowledge is highly fragmented and actually a really interesting piece of work needs to be done to capture that information, synthesize it and reformat it so it can be shared and can be used. And lastly, the third pillar is around accessibility. How can we ensure that access to knowledge is available, that knowledge can be accessible to the right people in the right forms? Well, we need to think about the barriers firstly, thinking about language, not just in terms of translation, but also thinking about sectoral jargon, thinking about how 
how can that research be communicated in a language that is understandable depending on the you're from? Equally, we need to think about finances, thinking about open source technologies, thinking about paywalls. Are they restricting information flows? Are they restricting access? And equally, thinking about how can knowledge be applied? How can we embark implied, applied research? Thinking about being more creative with knowledge products. It's not just about a research report and an executive summary, but thinking about different mediums with voice, visual, participatory methods like demonstration uh, workshops and face-to-face -face discussions as well. And remembering that there is life beyond the print run, thinking that once a research report has been written, thinking about how do we follow follow up with stakeholders, follow up with beneficiaries, and thinking about trying to increase the life of knowledge. So ultimately at Practical Action, we believe that there's enough knowledge in the world to solve our greatest problems. But if we fail to learn and get the knowledge to the right people at the right time, in the right format, we'll never succeed. So we've been applying these three pillars to our work with the Low Carbon Energy Development Network, working in Kenya and in Bangladesh. We started with a stakeholder mapping, moved to understand and knowledge gaps and communication preferences, and are now looking at capturing and reformatting information. We'll then be using different communication preference, which, is ha which have been identified from our workshops. It's been a great opportunity to really put our understandings of appropriateness, availability and accessibility into practice. So I'd like you to think about next time you embark upon research, to think about uptake, to think about the issues in hand, the needs and the communication preferences and remembering those three pillars, appropriateness, availability, and accessibility. And equally, thinking about some questions. In your experience, what has worked? What hasn't worked? Is, it, is research useful? Is it answering to needs? How can it be applied? And how can practitioners influence the research agenda? Ultimately, this work can really challenge the research community. So I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to speak today and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was uh, fantastic and a great introduction to the uh, topic. And uh, apologies, everybody, for the slight tr cross-talking sound halfway through that. Um, I'd now like to invite uh, Sarah's colleague, Ifat Khan, to um, unmute herself and to uh, talk a little bit more about the work that Practical Action has been doing on this, specifically in Bangladesh. So Ifat Khan is the Knowledge and Business Development Specialist from Practical Action's office in Bangladesh. Uh, over to you, Ifat. Is Ifat still with us? Uh, I'm not no. getting the invitation to share screen. Okay. That should be there. Well, thank you very much, Barney. I would like to talk about, uh, it's a case study that Sarah actually built, built on. Um, I am Ifat Khan. I work in Practical Action Bangladesh office. And together with LCEDN, we are actually uh, trying to develop a guideline for solar waste disposal. Now, this is, uh, I mean, evident that, you know, we have knowledge available, though it may not be in a user-friendly format all the time. And it's actually really important to consider that, you know, what are the needs of the, of the users, namely the practitioners and the communities. Uh, but usually it's found that research actually is actually focusing on something very high tech and the users are probably not getting the, the, the result of all the research uh, communicated to them. Uh, we are actually we want to ensure that the knowledge leaves an impact in people's lives, namely, people uh, people's practice and behavior should change because of the knowledge that that you know they they, they acquire. So 
the specific case um, is that you know we we actually did the, that early stakeholder engagement um, and we, we held a workshop here in Dhaka in Bangladesh and the key question that we asked is what where what what are the challenges that stakeholders are facing in relation to energy access and in terms of knowledge and what are the key knowledge gaps basically in this space and you know we brought together all these people uh, from uh, government agencies the practitioners private organizations academicians and researchers all the people who are very relevant in the energy sector here in Bangladesh and you know who are in a position to you know change uh, the whole situation that we are actually in so you know in terms of energy so you know just to give you an example you know we had from the government at Energy and Power Research Council, we had SREDA, um, you know, the Sustainable and Renewable Energy Development Authority, uh, you know, Gramin Shukti, Rohima Froze, these people are operating in the in the renewable energy sector uh, for a really long, long time. You know, our reputed uh, ac academic uh, institutions. So all these are just a few. I mean, I haven't given the whole list here. So all these people, were together and you know we found that key challenges were that you know the research that these people do these academic institutions are doing are actually very high tech you know for for international journal publication it's uh, it's not actually uh, attentive toward the social environmental and business models that will be actually applicable for the local communities um, and you know because of that there is a big gap between the researchers and the practitioners uh, because practitioners are more focused to the grassroots while uh, all these research institutions they were actually doing something that was totally you know different from what the communities were needing so in in line with that we came up we we found that there are two clear areas where we need to work where there is a gap. One is the implementation and disposal of renewable energy technologies, and the other is business and financial models for renewable uh, energy technologies. The, the, to, influence, to have influencing policies uh, for national coordination. The one that we are working on right now is the disposal of renewable energy technology, which is specifically applicable for solar technology. Uh, we have, you know, more than half uh, or nearly as half of, of the solar uh, home systems that have been um, installed globally uh, are actually installed in Bangladesh itself. And, but, you know, we have installed them and, you know, people are benefiting from that, that especially in the rural areas where the national grid, the national electricity hasn't re reached. But, you know, what, what, what's happening with the batteries? What's happening with the panels? They are just you know, whenever there, they, there is a need for repair, it's just being, uh, you know, replaced and dropped here and there. It's a hazard for public health. Uh, it's really causing a hazard in the environment. So there was a strong need for the national guideline for the government use for, for awareness raising for everybody to be a part of it. And, you know, be aware that how we have, we can make sure that uh, we don't cause problem for the environment. So right now, I just, uh, it's probably a little bit, uh, a lot of things in this, in this diagram. So basically everybody is dumping uh, the things here and there. The consumers, you know, their, their households, the industries, the organizations, everybody who are actually using solar uh, system, uh, they're actually either dumping it or they're giving it to the collectors who actually collect these wastes and, you know, they, they sort of recycle it, but not in a very uh, like systematic way. Um, they collect it and, you know, they just take the parts that, that you know, they have, that they need uh, the segregators, they segregate different type, types of like batteries. They, you know, there is a market for, for used batteries and, you know, the panels, they go for some, they go somewhere else. Uh, the chips, they go somewhere else. So, you know, everybody just segregates what they need and they just they're just dumping uh you know in the open land or field so 
you know, that that is becoming a problem. So, you know, this has to be a system there. We, we realize that there, there should be a system uh, as to how to do, do these things properly. properly. So, you know, we have engaged, uh, uh, you know, from the very early on, we have engaged experts, the users, the service providers, you know, all those people who are actually installing the solar systems, solar home systems or, or small grids, mini grids, uh, grids or uh, nano grids. Um, the technicians who actually uh, are, who are actually called to, to repair these uh, things uh, whenever there is a problem. And you know the traders, even the financiers, uh, who actually finance uh, installing of these uh, solar panels uh, or, or home, home system. Uh, so we have engaged them. We have analyzed the gap. That's why it's green. We have already done the gap analysis, and you know we are visiting the fields. We are consulting them. We are of course building on the existing knowledge, both national and international. Um, and you know we are collecting the data. We are observing, and you know. Then we are going to come up with, uh, and that is a part actually uh, that's not yet done. Um, so, you know, those data collection and focus group discussion, as you can see, that part is not yet done. Uh, we are very close to doing that. And so, you know, once we have all the data in place, all the information and knowledge in, in, in place, we plan to disseminate this to the, to the relevant stakeholders again to get their proper feedback that, you know, as Sarah said, that, you know, these need to be communicated properly. Everybody needs to understand what uh, are the consequences, what are the procedures. So we just want to make sure that all these, all the knowledge are actually <clears throat> communicated properly. And, you know, so far our takeaways are that, you know, this, uh, this early communication has been made with stakeholders for whom this guideline will be prepared. And they are actually a part of this whole thing from the very beginning and every step of the way. So, you know, it's a good opportunity, this, this, this uh, whole study that we're doing um, and the whole system that we have built on that how to make this gu guideline, that, you know, it's a good opportunity to gather the learning that how it actually works out in the end. And maybe it will allow us to reshape how research is conducted in the, in, the, in the future, that instead of focusing on the academic parts, it's actually more uh, about engaging people who will actually end up using that knowledge. So that is it. Thank you so much for, for your uh, patience. Uh, of course, my email address is here if you have any further questions. Uh, thank you so, so much. Thank you very much, Ifat. That, uh, that was great. The, um, that's really, I think, uh, contextualised this for us uh, as to to how this um, this bridging of research and uh, and practice can really happen at the at the grassroots level. And I'm sure there'll be a lot more questions about the the specifics of that. Uh, before we go on to the next presentation, I'd like to encourage people to continue to be uh, sending in their questions that we can then address during the question and answer session. Right, I would uh, now like to uh, give a presentation myself talking about some of the, the relevant uh, aspects of this issue that we have found from our work in the Smart Villages project. Um, so this will be not, not specifically work that we've done ourselves, but what people that we have engaged with around the world have told us. So, uh, just to introduce the Smart Villages project very briefly first. Um, why smart is, is a smart way to move. So the Smart Villages project was really founded around the idea that half of the world's population and the majority of the world's poor live in rural villages. Uh, everybody's very keen these days on smart cities uh, as, the, uh, as the, the way to progress. Uh, but of course, the majority of, uh, of the people who are living in poverty and half the world's population live in villages and aren't likely to to move to the cities anytime soon. So it's important to pay attention to uh, to that half of the world as well. Uh, technological advantages and indeed game-changing innovations, we've everything that we've seen, for example, in the the mobile telecommunications revolution, means that the balance of advantage can be 
can be shifted so that people don't have to be in cities. Uh, it's possible to access all of the sorts of services um, at the village level as well. So for us, a smart village means uh, a village that is able to harness technology to provide uh, not just energy in the village, maybe, but food security, democratic engagement, uh, innovative ways of accessing health and welfare and education services, and of course, to drive local businesses. And uh, we have seen that this sort of smart approach lets us uh, address multiple sustainable development goals at the same time. Uh, we've been uh, focusing really on how those energy solutions and, and other technologies can help that and working towards policy advice and engaging all of the key players, especially down at the grassroots level, uh, to address some of the questions about barriers and opportunities. We've been working for the past three years across the six priority regions of the world um, to ask these questions, in particular, bringing together um, stakeholder groups, bringing together people from financing agencies, from villages themselves, from NGOs, entrepreneurs and academics to discuss uh, what the particular challenges are in each of the countries and regions that we've been working in. Uh, you'll see in the handouts for the webinar we've uh, made some of our findings available and indeed you can visit our website uh, after the webinar to check out more of our, more of our material. But in terms of research to practice, there are some particular things that I'd, uh, that I'd like to bring out. Uh, issues around capacity building and knowledge exchange, issues around researches, research and evaluation. Some insights as well from a workshop that we were invited to attend last week, which comes out of the Low Carbon Energy for Development Networks projects uh, around understanding sustainable energy solutions, the uses projects. Uh, you'll be able to find out more about that um, workshop from the LCED and website, uh, but there was one whole session about uh, this research and practice question and uh, I'd just like to bring out some of the uh, some of the discussions that happened there in, in Kenya last week uh, and to make some final recommendations for taking this whole area forward. So on the capacity building and knowledge exchange side, um, all of the participants, every single workshop that we held around the world really brought out this great need for skills and institutional capacity building at, at the grassroots level around the world. There are some interesting approaches to that. So I know that uh, the University of Nairobi, for example, and of course the Barefoot uh, Power Organization have training and qualification programs to bring those specific technical skills to, uh, to people working at the grassroots level. Um, Businesses talked about and entrepreneurs talked about the needs for them to receive uh, uh, help with business skills and uh, more ongoing support for entrepreneurs as they continue to build their businesses. And there are industry organizations like Taria, for example, in Tanzania or, or government run incubators that can provide those sorts of services. And also the need for for end users in particular to be aware of all the different technology options there are for providing energy and um, opportunities for productive use and the whole seeing is believing program actually seeing some of these systems being put in place by researchers and NGOs and others is a great way of, uh, of taking that forward. It's also important though uh, I think for uh, for researchers to be aware of the issues in the environment on the ground and uh, and this is very much I think one of the one of the angles of the practical action work that we've been hearing about and there one interesting approach was from a, uh, a grassroots organization in uh, Indonesia called Ibeka. Uh, one of the things that they did was work with newly qualified engineers uh, from who were coming out of the university training system in Indonesia and their uh, their project placed each of those engineers in a rural village for six months and um, the, uh, uh, the rather rambunctious leader of Ibeka, um, Iskander Kunturaji, uh, described this initiative with a, uh, a very shorthand term of uh, sit down, shut up and listen. So the point was that each of these engineers would just be in a, lo in a local rural environment just seeing for themselves what all the issues were and, and hearing from the villagers themselves what their challenges were and the idea was that after six months of that they would have a, an appreciation and understanding of those issues that they could then take on into their professional work in the future. Moving on into research and evaluation, um, every, uh, it was a frequently brought out uh, from the various workshops and consultations that we had that there was a need for academia and frontline organizations to collaborate more. Um, there were collaborations but they were quite infrequent um, the lower level of uh, 
of research and development work going on locally tended to mean that there were a lot of uh, international organizations, international uh, uh, universities being involved in things and, and not so much local support, which was obviously very important uh, as being easily accessible to people in local communities. And then this idea of the opportunity for feedback that the it's actually the local experience and uh, and the problems and challenges that the uh, the local communities are encountering on an ongoing basis, which in turn should be driving new research. Uh, so it's important to make that whole relationship a bi-directional one. Uh, something else that was brought out was the importance of of adequate as opposed to comprehensive solutions. Uh, certainly we found many of the, uh, the academic researchers, especially on the technical side, were very keen to, uh, to be developing optimum systems, things that were the, um, the, the greatest efficiency, maybe. Uh, not understanding that sometimes having the very best system wasn't really appropriate in a local situation because it might be more challenging to maintain or it might be more expensive or it might be more difficult to uh, to use. So this idea of, of locally appropriate technology versus the best that is possibly available is an important one. Um, also the idea to, to stimulate university researchers uh, with an application focus in the uh, in development uh, was important. Some researchers are working on on the the cutting edge of their own uh, their own fields, maybe developing new materials, and hadn't necessarily thought of the application of their research for a a development context. So again, to have this this bi-directional conversation was seen as being very important. Uh, not everybody. Uh, can obviously do all of that outreach and that coordination themselves. So the idea of going through coordinating agencies in a, in a country or in an industry sector, or maybe a facilitator like uh, using maybe even the media to be able to share that information was an important thing. And also something very important that was brought out again and again for researchers to then recognize the contribution of the village in their final work. Uh, to, so to, to acknowledge that it was the, the input from the villages or the NGOs that they were working with that it all also contributed to the outcomes of their research. Moving on to the feedback from the uses workshop last week in uh, Nakuru in Kenya, um, it was brought out very uh, importantly that different stakeholder groups require distinct approaches. So uh, how you as a researcher communicate with government or the communities themselves or businesses or NGOs will clearly be uh, very different. The need for better north-south and south-south research collaboration. And, and the idea that early engagement and feedback is also necessary. So for uh, research projects to engage with uh, government stakeholders and the local communities, whoever they're trying to influence, right from the beginning gives those different stakeholder groups a sense of buy-in and support for the research, which is much better than carrying out the research and then trying to engage at the end, as I'm sure uh, most of our participants here are aware. Tailoring the messages and information to those individual stakeholder groups as well. Uh, not everybody needs or wants to know everything. And the importance of social sciences research versus physical sciences. This is also something that came out of um, uh, uh, the Smart Villages work. So uh, the physical sciences and the actual technology is all very well, but it's almost more important the work that is being done in the social sciences to see how can that best be applied. How can it? How can uh, how can community uptake of these technologies? Uh, really be supported? What's the best way of getting communities to engage with that? That's the sort of thing that's coming from social science researchers around the world. And that is almost more critical to be able to share with uh, the community of practitioners than some of the harder, uh, harder science technology uh, work. New forms of academic output. Uh, very interestingly, some of the uh, participants in the, uh, the panel session down in the uses workshop were saying that uh, their university, in particular, I think it was the University of Nairobi, instead of encouraging its uh, master's students to produce a final dissertation, had encouraged them to uh, produce a final project that actually did some tangible work in the field. Uh, and that's something for academia, I think, to think about, just different ways of engagement that actually uh, brings academia down from its ivory tower and out into the field. 
the importance for funders of research to fund that outreach, not just the core research, is also critical uh, because obviously that outreach is quite difficult and can be expensive. Uh, so it's something that everybody felt that funders should also be doing. And of course, to be aware of the constraints in communicating uh, uh, research to, uh, to rural areas in terms of language, access to communications channels and technologies uh, and local partners and indeed local research partners were seeing as being very important there. So to build some final recommendations around that, uh, to build outreach and communications into research from the very start and for funders of research to fund that, identifying uh, partners that can help disseminate that information, uh, to realize that knowledge comes from many places, uh, not just from, uh, from uh, academia and research organizations, and therefore to encourage bi-directional information flow. To bring in the social sciences research so that uh, people are able to understand the how to, not just the, the what, and to innovate, to encourage researchers also to innovate in terms of how they think about application and communication of their work. And importantly also to share data. There is a tendency, especially amongst um, uh, entrepreneurs and commercial organizations to collect data and keep it for themselves. Uh, but also it's very easy for uh, researchers to, to gather information and, and then keep that data uh, without thinking of how the how the raw data could also be shared, which would also obviously be of greater benefit for the whole community. Uh, so thank you very much. That was just to share some of the uh, the insights that we've gathered from the the last few uh, years of our own work. So now we will throw it out to uh, to John to to chair the question and answer session. Brilliant. Okay. Thanks very much indeed for that, Benny. Obviously, I know some of the materials that you guys are going to present anyway because we've sort of started to work quite closely with each other but it's still nonetheless kind of interesting to hear um, these things framed uh, quite so clearly so um, I think I'm going to start off just by <laughs> sort of abusing my position as as uh, as a master of ceremonies to ask some questions of my own or perhaps to all three of you guys to start off with um, the idea, you talk about the the need for um, one kind of engagement by academics, which I would call the the practitioner academic interface, which is to say academics should have practical field experience, not just of doing research, but actually implementing and helping run projects. And this is something that's really quite dear to my own heart, having some experience of both uh, helping develop projects on a theoretical basis, writing about them, but actually being in the field hands on and building things. So I wondered. Uh, if all three of you think there is a role for a sort of a specific type of practitioner academic and Bernie in particular mentioned the need for um, transdisciplinarity, different disciplines in participating, engineers knowing about social science and social scientists knowing about engineering uh, and it seems to me that this is this is quite a critical area so I wonder if I could sort of throw that as a question to all three of you. Do you think that there's a definite role for a specific kind of person like that and if so uh, how do we implement them and what do they do so so may maybe Sarah is it fair to start with you and to see what sure. you think about that okay thank you John thanks for the question so at the beginning I talked about kind of there being kind of two colliding worlds so the kind of academic world and then kind of practice kind of looking more at NGOs because that's kind of where my experience lies but what I think is really important is actually not to see these different sectors in their silos but thinking about how do we break those silos down and actually think about kind of interdisciplinary communities and thinking about what is it that different stakeholders can bring to the table and thinking about how can those well, multiple worlds collide around this issue around uptake and I think just to kind of refer back as well to what Bernie was saying about you know that appreciation that knowledge comes from different places I definitely think that there is a role there for the kind of applied researcher um, and I think that expert knowledge is really really valuable and I think what I think as well we also do need to challenge expertise and thinking about you know how can grassroots organizations communities and those pot potential voices that are not heard actually shape agendas as well so you know marrying academic expertise with more kind of tacit knowledge from the field as well I think 
there's a role there to marry the two. Um, but yeah, I definitely think there's a role. I think it's just about trying to think about how, how do those worlds collide? Um, I'm thinking about the different areas of knowledge and bringing it together. Okay, thanks for that, Sarah. Uh, if that, would you like to um, comment? No, I think I mostly agree with Sarah that we have a similar stamp that uh, instead of seeing it, you know, as two isolated, it's kind of bridging them together. So, yeah. Okay. Um, yes, I think from... Uh, I think from my point of view, I think it's, a, uh, it's an excellent point and, uh, and uh, good answers from Sarah and Ifad. I think there are, I think there are two challenges, though, to, to bear in mind with that. There's certainly a role for, uh, for that sort of person. Um, one, one issue I can think of is that it's, it's very difficult for one person to do absolutely everything. Um, you know, the, as, as people talk about this, you know, they constantly throw out more and more uh, sort of, you know, individual things that that should be done or that uh, uh, that would be would be nice to have done and contacts to make. And there's a there's a limit to just how much you know one individual can do themselves. But that, uh, that's not to say there's the, there's not a role for somebody to try and and do the most relevant bits of that. Um, maybe one of the the other important things to bear in mind though is how universities um, reward uh, or, or acknowledge people's work so uh, in a world where universities are all very keen to uh, uh, to just see the uh, the, uh, the more traditional outputs of research and publications I think there would need to be some some structure in that system for rewarding rewarding researchers who are also uh, practitioners who are also doing work in the field, and that, that somehow should also be, be counted uh, towards their uh, towards their performance. Yeah. I think I think that's quite important as well. Okay, thanks very much indeed for that, Bernie. Actually, I, I don't seem to. I just wanted to say to the audience, by the way, uh, if you have questions that you would uh, like a more complete answer to, or perhaps need a fuller answer anyway. Um, you, you're welcome to send them in to us anyway, and we'll, we'll pass them on to the relevant presenter, uh, who, who we hope will answer as soon as possible and get in contact with you. But uh, at the moment, I don't seem to have any questions showing, so I'm going to further abuse my Master of Ceremonies role by asking a particular question, which obviously we're all quite interested in, about the idea of recycling. Now, uh, in IFAT's presentation, uh, you mentioned uh, recycling and the kind of things that are being done, but it, it does seem actually in a lot of the areas that we've worked in seem to be uh, a growing area. And for me, it seems to me perhaps uh, in terms of e-waste, the most critical area, because if you can repurpose e-waste, if you can uh, recycle it to do other things, um, and you can create a business for, uh, for, for people as well as getting rid of the waste. And I just wondered if I, perhaps you could perhaps speak to that, maybe. Um, yeah. Well, uh, recycling. I mean, you know, it's not very common here uh, at this moment. Like, you know, it's not recycling in the sense that you know, in in the UK, for example, um, it's more about like you know those little chips uh, that we have. It's just an example that we have in the in the e-waste. Uh, they they actually they're they're doing something like uh, they're melting the metal down and using you know sending that metal to to different uh, um, state you know businesses where they are actually relevant uh, stuff like that but you know it doesn't happen that often it doesn't really happen that often you know we are also looking into ways to recycle the uh, how to actually encourage recycling of e-waste uh, along with that. Um, like the existing business. Hello? Go on, Sarah. Yes. Yes. Sorry, sorry. Just to add as well, I think one of the um, 
core areas of practical action um, is looking at uh, the circular economy. Um, so that very much kind of sings to kind of solar e-waste as well. So, you know, thinking about technology, the kind of life cycle of that technology is, is really important, both not just in terms of um, technology use in terms of from design to use to waste, but also um, in terms of local innovation. Um, so thinking about how technologies can be adapted beyond their immediate purposes um, and thinking differently about that as well. Um, and just to say as well that this also links, the issue of solar e-waste also links to our work around um, trying to better understand climate technologies. So thinking about um, how issues around solar waste can contribute um, or equally prevent um, climate change and carbon emissions as well. So all kind of under one umbrella. Yeah, so for me, there's a different uh, selection of sectors that we need to think about. I think uh, one of the things that came out of the Nakuru workshop is how to engage with the informal sector. Uh, and it was regarded as very much a kind of, uh, oh, that's, that's a bit of a, of a difficult thing. How do you do that? But plainly for a large number of the people and a substantial percentage of the populations in which we work, the informal sector is pretty much going to be all they ever know. So building recycling and, and repurposing new stuff into that, it's already being done in certain ways, like uh, this, the, the Daravi slum outside Mumbai in India mm. is a massive recycling centre. Um, in Kenya, the Juakali, which means fierce sun uh, um, engineering, a local indigenous engineering sector is, is rebuilding and repurposing other people's machinery. So there's a substantial thing, such things going on there anyway. And for my money, it seems to be uh, we'd be silly to leave those people out and potentially an enormous resource to build the informal sector recycling economy into the waste. Mm -hmm. um, so we have comments, but I'm kind of Okay, lacking uh, too many questions. Um, I wonder then perhaps I'm going to move on to something else. Uh, I like the idea of good enough is best. Um, and it's something that comes up in the literature quite a bit. And I wondered if all three of you perhaps might like to just expand on that if you agree with it. I mean, plainly you could disagree, uh, and see how what what you're thinking on that might be. How, how is how is good enough is best to be implemented, and how, how might we pursue that as a as a goal in itself? I mean, Sarah, perhaps you, you might like to lead off on that. So, John, if you could just clarify by what you mean uh, by that term, and then okay. we can. Thank you. So, particularly in. Um, in uh, uh, technical, tech, what we call technocratic projects, where the engineering perhaps takes precedence over everything else, it can be one of the aims of the project to set the, say, a solar hub or a, or a, I don't know, a wind project or whatever it might be, uh, to um, very high quality and technical standards, mm -hmm. which are not necessarily maintainable because there is a supply chain problem or mm -hmm. the uh, out. Uh, outlets for these things are not great uh, and that kind of thing there's a there's an argument that says even on a technical basis that you should design a project to fit what's going on uh, in the uh, in, you know in, in in the environment in which it's supposed to operate so that would be a technical thing and uh, there's mm. also some literature that suggests that in terms of putting together governance structures mm. um, there's a lot of ideas that you can you can copy over Western Northern parliamentary democratic institutions and you should aim for the best one you, pop it, you, you can and try and, and make sure that that democracy is as good as you can make it but that tends to ignore local socio-economic realities uh, indigenous mm -hmm. tribal ethnic mm -hmm. religious differences and so on and so forth so that's really what I mean sorry to mm -hmm. go on there. Mm -hmm. no no thank yeah. you thank you John um so I think just just hearing you there it very much kind of links back to um kind of systems thinking so you know trying not to just see as a, an issue in isolation and an issue kind of between the implementer implementer and the beneficiary so trying to think about who else is involved in that both in terms of in terms of the challenge and and the issue itself but also in terms of who is involved or potentially could be 
engaged with or been um, by the intervention. So trying to have a more systemic approach, I think. And I think thinking very much around um, contextualizing everything I think in terms of you know if there are high quality technical solutions but that can't be properly implemented then we need to be thinking about actually local adaptation and appropriateness and going back to those three pillars really thinking about what is appropriate but also how do we make sure that other voices beyond those implementers are engaged um, you know, I think it's about trying to make sure that you have real kind of local adaptation and local voices to to support interventions when maybe kind of the technologies themselves are are, are too difficult to implement. implement. Yeah. Okay. I'll throw it over to if had any ideas. Can I just, uh, I've just received two questions. So I want to kind of, if you guys could hold your answers. <laughs> there are a couple of questions that have come in for Sarah, uh, particularly. One was about what Practical Action is doing to recycle batteries at the moment, um, uh, and you know what, what kind of things are being done. And the other one, which I've just lost for the time being. OK, can you answer? Uh, would you like to have a go at the recycling batteries one, Sarah, just to? So, hands up, I'm not an energy specialist, so I, if you'd like to email me your question directly, then I can ask our energy team. I, I guess, kind of, at the moment, it's very much on our horizon as an area that um, we are engaged with in, in some of our country work, um, in Kenya in particular. Um, but it's all kind of looking at that um, circular economy um, piece. Um, and thinking about reuse um, and building that back into the system. Um, I, th I think in terms of the actual kind of specifics in terms of what we're actually doing, um, let me consult our energy team um, and I'll, I will get the answers yeah. back to you. All right then. And um, actually burning on from that, what we were saying, there's another question about examples of uh, operational research, which I should probably throw open to all three of you, and we, did, we talked about operational research in, in a kind of vague and, uh, way. I'd like to suggest that what we've been doing in Nakuru County with the Soil and Anagris project is perhaps an example of that, but maybe you have other examples of, of the kinds of things you're thinking about. Um, Bernie, maybe you could start with that. Um, yes, it's a, it's a good question. I think... Um, there are the the uses count uh, the uses project, and in particular, what we saw last week in Nakura, I think, is particularly good in terms of how it has um, uh, really got the researchers very practically into the uh, the local the local community and, and made that relationship very very um, very very bi-directional. There is some. Um, there is a lot of good work that we know of that is going on as well in um, in Southeast Asia, and in particular, um, uh, we have been working quite closely with the University of uh, Malaysia in Sarawak in Kuching, uh, Malaysia, uh, who've been uh, uh, carrying out out what is possibly one of the most interdisciplinary university uh, research projects I've ever seen, uh, combining. The, uh, uh, the the energy experts, with the engineers, the computer scientists, the social anthropologists, even the uh, the creative arts faculty of the university, um, in looking at challenges that are being faced by uh, uh, indigenous communities living in small villages in the middle of the rainforest, and how they can harness uh, technology. Um, and put it to productive use and maybe how they can add value to local goods to make them more marketable and generate more value um, and make it easier to sell things to bring in more um, uh, more wealth into the community. Uh, so that is some particularly uh, good work that's been done and uh, they've needed, especially the social anthropologists, to understand those local issues and, and how uh, the, local, uh, uh, the local people react um, to the technologies and what they want from the technologies and indeed you know what what unanticipated uses they can uh, put the technologies to so for example in uh, in a couple of those projects 
uh, where an issue was uh, was identified for the local community, maybe that the uh, uh, young people were were leaving the villages and weren't really uh, sort of there wasn't a shared understanding between the the village elders and the young people. They were putting technology to novel use so that the young were able to use uh, sort of iPads to film the elders talking about some of the uh, the indigenous uh, plants in the rainforest and the uh, the medicinal uses of those plants. Uh, but they were using the technology to to document that, and therefore it brought the the young people into those projects. It was also those projects that first raised the issue of, uh, of locally appropriate technology for us, uh, because when they were when they were building some of the uh, the local distributed energy systems, um, uh, it was quite clear to the people working in the communities that they couldn't use the very best batteries, because only, if anything went wrong with those batteries, uh, they couldn't be replaced for months on end. So it was actually better for the communities to use a battery that was maybe half as good but they could very easily get a replacement from the closest shop um, so those are the sorts of, uh, of challenges we're talking about in, in that sort of area as well okay so we've got quite a few questions coming in and I'm kind of bunging them this way to the various presenters Sarah I think I just sent you a question do you do you did you receive that Okay. Uh, okay, I'm going to ask a question to all of you from one of the audience, which is what are the ways for researchers in developing countries to disseminate their outcomes more widely? This is a question that comes up quite substantially uh, a lot of the time, uh, whether it be uh, uh, postgrads or, or, or more senior academics. So I'm wondering if you guys, I mean, have, have much experience with this or ways in which uh, dissemination of research outcomes from the global south can be more widely disseminated um maybe if that you could start off with that i'm, I'm sorry i lost your voice for a minute can you just ask again i'm very sorry, sorry about that ways, ways in which researchers from the global south uh, can disseminate to reach policy makers are there ways which you would recommend uh, ways which you can get around this this sort of north south barrier perhaps or even South South Barry, in terms of uh, getting research known between private research and policy sector in the global south, what are the ways for people to to to? to try? That okay? In fact, still getting static actually. Maybe somebody <laughs> else can. Yeah. Can you type? I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. I can make a start. Bernie, maybe. Oh, yes. Yes, go on. Um, so I would say, I mean, this is this is something that we have done quite a bit of work on uh, over the over the years, and I think it's it's particularly challenging um, for researchers from developing countries, as well as some of the 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 audiences in developing countries that they're trying to reach, uh, because all of the problems that we've talked about, you know, researchers not being able to go out and uh, uh, disseminate their uh, their work, uh, that's exacerbated in um, in many. Uh, developing countries uh, because of a, a lack of funds. I know that some of the countries that we have worked on, uh, worked in, uh, researchers say they, they barely get enough funds to actually be able to pay the salaries of the researchers in the institutions, let alone trying to do any communications. Um, so very often what the, uh, uh, what the, what the participant who posed the question uh, suggested that it looks as though researchers are already working for their own benefit. You know, that's 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 literally almost all that they are able to do with the funding that they have. I would say there are there are two things that that can be done um, if possible. One is to uh, one is to build on this whole sort of seeing is believing thing. So uh, uh, you know, uh, d maybe decision makers and, and government officials and politicians in those countries. Um, are also don't have you know the the, the freedom to uh, to travel widely and, and 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 gather their own information. So for a research institution to invite in a a group of uh, of politicians, say or decision makers, is a very valuable thing because it then lets the uh, uh, lets those people actually see with their own eyes the work that is being done and, and start to engage with the researchers. Uh, the other thing is for researchers to try and get some uh, some local champions uh, and we have always found that the 
the media are <clears throat> are good people to try to engage uh, along those lines. So to to welcome the uh, uh, the media, particularly I think broadcast media, radio, uh, and a particular radio in uh, in local languages. To invite those people into your research institution to break down some of the barriers between researchers and uh, and the media, so that the <clears throat> the researchers are no longer scared of the media and the media are no longer scared of the researchers, and that they they have a little bit of understanding of each other's worlds and that the media can actually uh, see for themselves the sort of work that the researchers are doing, uh, and then in turn talk about it on their own radio shows or in their own newspapers. I think that's a that's a valuable and and relatively easy way to start to try to uh, uh, to disseminate the uh, the outputs and, and outcomes of, of the research. And I think just to add to that as well, Bernie, just some examples from um, practical action. I think another way that um, researchers in the Global South can help to can, well, communicate their, their findings is through networks. There's so many different networks, you know, face to face networks in country, um, but equally online. Um, Practical Action leads on um, a knowledge exchange website um, called Knowledge Point, um, which is basically a, a question and answer platform where practitioners from all around the world uh, post their questions and we're always looking for experts to answer them. Um, so that's a really good example of trying to um, really use research in practice in an applied manner. And then I think equally um, another way to communicate research is also through um, research centres and resource centres. So just to draw upon our work in Nepal, we work really closely with the district um, resource centres. Um, they're based in um, every district um, and we run various um, participatory methods and activities um, out of those centres. And one of them is um, a expert facilitation discussion um, and community meeting whereby we have certain sectoral experts who come and they teach communities about various different issues and kind of upskilling those gatekeepers and um, key stakeholders in communities as well. So trying to think about kind of participatory ways as well. So my kind of points would be around online sharing of information, face-to-face -face networks, and trying to think about different participatory methods to share findings as well, rather than thinking um, kind of static research uh, reports and journals. Yeah, that's great, Sarah. Actually, that bring, brings me around to, to your last point about that. Um, on the LCDN website, if anyone has a blog about a project or a piece of research, or you have an event forthcoming, we don't care which country you're in or what you're doing. Uh, obviously, you know, the, as long as it's to the point of the website, we're quite happy to put up pieces of research, papers, um, um, uh, blogs, as I said, photographs. Um, we would be very happy for you to get in contact with us. And perhaps we can help in that respect uh, as well. We, the, the website does have quite a few hundred members and uh, these are all people working in the low carbon energy for development community. Um, I think we've overrun our time, Bernie, so perhaps um, that's the point to draw it to a close. Please, can I say to the, if I didn't uh, ask your question or you, the, you've asked something that hasn't been answered, if you if you email in or, or, or you send your message in again with, with a, a contact email, then we will do our level best to make sure that the relevant person gets back to you with an answer. So other than that, I'll hand over back to you, Bernie. Thank you very much, John, and uh, thank you very much to uh, to all of our presenters. Thank you very much to uh, to Sarah Begg, and if I can, and uh, thank you very much to all of our participants. As John says, if you have any specific questions, please do uh, email those in. Um, the questions that have been asked, we will uh, get answers to all of those, and we can put them on the page of our website the, where this webinar will be archived. Um, over the next few hours, we'll be putting up the presentations and the uh, recording of the webinar on YouTube, if you wish to, uh, to view or listen to that again. Uh, in the meantime, I thank you all for your uh, participation this morning or this afternoon, wherever in the world you are. Thank our presenters again and wish all of you the very best for the, uh, the upcoming holiday season. Thanks very much and uh, look forward to having you join us next time.